In this video, I'm going to give you an introduction to <clears throat> animal body systems. When we return from break, I'm going to be going into a lot of detail about a couple of the body systems, but for this lesson, we're going to go over briefly a few of the body systems and give you kind of an overview. Remember, in um, organisms, there's a level of organization. So we start with the basic unit of life, which is cells, and then the bodies of organisms, um, and here we're talking mainly about animals, um, there are tissues, which are groups of cells that work together to form a per perform a particular function. There are organs, which are tissues that work together to form a function. And then there are organ systems, which are groups of organs that perform a, a specific function. And then to build an entire body, such as a human or even any other animal, you group the organ systems together. Um, so the purpose, remember, of the organ systems is the maintenance of homeostasis, keeping the insides constant while the outsides might be changing. Um, pretty much all but one of the organ systems, that's their job, to maintain homeostasis. So just a brief overview of the four main tissue types in animals. The first is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue lines surfaces, interior surfaces, such as the lining of the stomach, or the lining inside your mouth, or something like that, the lining around your organs, and also the exterior surfaces such as the skin. So here we have kidney tubules, stomach lining, and then epidermis, the outer skin layer. We have nervous tissue, which um, consists of the tissue that you would find in the brain and in nerves, in the spinal cord. We have connective tissue. Connective tissue um, includes bone, cartilage, and um, even blood. Blood is consi considered connective tissue. And then fat is also connective tissue. And then we have muscle tissue, which there are three kinds. There, there's smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle, which is only found in the heart. Skeletal muscle is found in your muscles of your arms and legs and things. And then smooth muscle is lining your organs, such as in your intestines. Those are the four main tissue types, epithelial, nervous, connective, and muscle. Let's talk a little bit about homeostasis. Homeostasis is the maintenance of the internal environment. It requires coordination of body systems. So this is keeping the insides constant. It's very important that your cells have a constant environment. So even though you're out in the world and things are changing, um, homeostasis allows you to remain the same in the inside. <clears throat> so, for instance, water. We have a thirst mechanism, for instance. That would be a one, um, one process that's is occurring that will allow you to maintain homeostasis of water as you feel thirsty so you get something to drink. Um, you feel hunger when you're lacking in nutrients. Your respiratory rate and heart rate change as a result of you needing um, more oxygen or less oxygen. You have homeostasis of temperature and you have homeostasis with regards to pressure. Now, homeostasis often involves a complex sequence of metabolic activities working together that monitor the levels and then respond to any changes. In animal bodies, there are both negative feedback systems and positive feedback systems. The most common is a negative feedback system where uh, the body would monitor the levels of something like temperature, um, glucose, oxygen, and then if it goes too low, there's a mechanism that increases the level. It will work to increase the level of that thing. Um, that is a negative feedback, or if you have too much, it works to decrease the level. A positive feedback system would be one in which, as the level goes up, there's a signal to go up even more and even more, so there's like a cascade effect. An example of a positive feedback system would be during childbirth. Um, the contractions that happen that... Um, are going to be pushing the baby out. The more contractions that happen, the more stimulated the uterus is to contract even more. And so it's because of that cascade of positive feedback that childbirth progresses. Um, for most systems, though, it's going to be a negative feedback system. So here's one example of a negative feedback system. We have um, blood calcium level. Okay, so this is homeostasis of blood calcium. If the calcium level is rising, let's say you just had a milkshake or something, um, at this point, the, the thyroid gland is um, stimulated to release a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin stimulates the bone to take up the excess calcium and also reduces the calcium uptake in the kidneys, which results in blood calcium levels declining. 
The other stimulus that could happen, this is number two, there could be a falling calcium level. Perhaps you're doing some activity that requires a lot of calcium, and um, so the calcium level decreases, or maybe you're not having as much calcium as you should and your levels have dropped. In this case, the parathyroid gland is stimulated to, to secrete um, a hormone called PTH or parathyroid hormone, and that's going to do two things. It's going to stimulate calcium to be released from the bones, and it's also going to stimulate the uptake of calcium in the kidneys. Okay. <clears throat> It also stimulates the release of vitamin D and increases calcium uptake in the intestines. So you're not releasing into the environment as waste the calcium in your intestines or the calcium from your kidneys. So both, both result in an increase of blood calcium. And so both of these systems, the PTH and the calcitonin, work simultaneously to monitor blood calcium levels and maintain them at about 10 milligrams per 100 milliliters, which is what your body needs. Let's talk about also about temperature homeostasis. This is um, real important in, in animals. We have three different ways of, of keeping temperature constant. There are endotherms, ectotherms, and heterotherms. Endotherms, such as mammals and birds, maintain homeostasis internally. So that's what we do. We're mammals. Um, when we're hot, we perspire. We have what's called vasodilation, which we increase the diameter of our blood vessels in the extremities, like the arms and the legs, and the fingers and the toes. We vasodilate, and that releases more heat to the environment. We also increase our heart rate and respiration to help remove some of that excess heat as well. When we're cold, there's shivering. Shivering actually does increase uh, the temperature in the, in the core a little bit. And then we also have vasoconstriction, which restricts the amount, it constricts down the blood vessel so that the diameter decreases and in the extremities, and that brings more of the blood to the center of the body and keeps the warmth at the center of the body where it's important. Um, so that's endotherms. Ectotherms maintain homeostasis behaviorally instead of physiologically. So in other words, an ectotherm would go sit on a, walk, go sit on a rock to warm up um, or to cool down, perhaps hide in the shade. That would be an ectotherm. And then heterotherms can vary how they maintain their body heat. Um, so they can vary between ectotherm and endotherm. An example of this is hummingbirds. So here are a couple of ways that um, organisms could maintain homeostasis of temperature. Here's an ectotherm, such as this lizard. He's going to sit on a rock. The rock is warmed by the sun. He's warmed by the sun, and that's how he increases his body temperature if it gets too, if it gets too low. Um, and then here, of course, our man's best friend, our little doggy, he's going to pant. And panting in dogs is a way for them to, to drop their body temperature. They're bringing cool air in from the environment, and it's cooling off their body. So the dog, remember, is an endotherm. So here's a summary. We have, if it's hot, we have vasodilation. We have sweating. We have pyrorelaxation, which means the hairs on your body flatten. And oftentimes you'll see behaviors such as stretching out. Okay, you're laying out, increasing your surface area, and that actually will cool the body. That's why you feel like doing that when you're really warm. If you're cold, there's vasoconstriction. We talked about that. Shivering. Uh, pyloerection. Okay, we're talking here about um, goosebumps. The hairs on your skin stand up. If you're an, an animal that's covered in fur, that's going to warm you up. And then curling up, making yourself smaller with a smaller surface area. And you've probably all experienced that when you're feeling really chilled. You just want to curl up into a ball. And there's a reason for that. It's because it's going to warm you up. Okay, we're already nine minutes in, but this is going to go a little bit long. So just bear with me. We're going to now go through um, some of the organ systems of animals briefly. Here are... The main systems, we're not going to talk about all of those in this lesson. We're going to reserve some for later, but these are the main systems of animals. We're going to start by talking a little bit about digestion. Remember, animal digestive system's job is to take in food, break it down, and make it available to body tissues. So what it's going to do is break it down into a form that's usable by the body. It can be taken in by cells. Some animals have a two-way digestive system. That is, undigested material is expelled through the mouth. So they take in food by the mouth, they digest it, whatever is undigestible or waste goes back out the same hole. That's not very efficient because you can only 
eat, digest, and let it back out again before you can eat again. So you can only eat once you're done digesting. It's not efficient. Other animals, such as us, have a, two, have a one-way system. We have a mouth and an anus, so we have a hole on either end. We can continue eating, and it doesn't. we don't have to stop to finish digesting. Along the way, of course, we have teeth that grind the food. We have muscles that squeeze. We call that mechanical digestion. We also have digestive enzymes that break down specific substances. We call this chemical digestion, and both occur. Here's an overview of the human digestive system. We have some um, salivary glands here in the mouth, which help digestion of starch in the mouth. We have the teeth and the tongue that grind the food up. The food then passes down into the esophagus, which is basically just a tube. It's squeezed down. It doesn't just drop. It's squeezed down, enters the stomach. In the stomach, there are some digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid. Mainly what's happening in the stomach is digestion of protein. From there, it's going to pass into the small intestine, which is found here. While in the small intestine, it's going to be fully digested and absorbed. The nutrients are going to be absorbed into the body. What's happening in the small intestine is digestion of all of the parts of food, fat, protein, and lipid. I'm sorry, fat, protein, and carbohydrate. The liver produces some digestive enzymes and also bile, which is stored here in the gallbladder and released into the small intestine to help digestion of fats. The pancreas here is going to be involved with many of the different um, digestive enzymes, as well as releasing some bicarbonate into the small intestine as the food is moved from the stomach into the small intestine to help neutralize the acid. Um, so all the digestion pretty much is taking place in the small intestine. The food is going to be resorbed into the body. And then what's left is passed into the colon or the large intestine. We have ascending, transverse, and descending colon. And then the during the course of the time that the food is passing through the colon or the large intestine, water is being moved back into the body so that we don't lose all that water. A lot of water is required for digestion, so it's going to be moved back into the bloodstream. From there, the, the waste moves into the rectum, where it's held until such time as you make it to the bathroom, and then it's going to pass out of the anus. Just a little bit about animals. Um, you can tell by the intestines and by the digestive system of an animal kind of what they eat. In an herbivore, you'll see multiple stomachs, for digesting all of that cellulose. You'll see a very long small intestine to be able to absorb the nutrients. It takes a while to digest all of that. There's even an auxiliary little structure here called the cecum and then um, the large intestine. In a carnivore, you'll see just a single stomach and a fairly short intestine um, because they're, it's, it's quick and easy to digest protein compared with all that cellulose. You can also tell a lot about digestion. Um, I'm sorry, you can tell a lot about what an organism eats by looking at their teeth. So we look at an animal such as this, the sharp, um, long canine teeth, and um, the sharp molars in the back you can see here indicate that this animal is a carnivore. And then we look at the teeth of an herbivore. You notice the incisors are flat. There's no canines. You just have incisors going across. And then, um, and so this indicates an herbivore. If you could see the molars, the molars wouldn't be sharp like this. They'd be flattened. And then we see um, an omnivore, such as this chimpanzee. And you can tell by looking at um, the chimp's teeth that he eats a variety of food. Um, so he's an omnivore. So we've got we've got some pointy. Um, canines here. This is a juvenile, so the canines haven't grown that large, and it actually might be a female. They're not quite as long in a female. You've got the, the incisors and the flattened molars, which indicate that this animal eats some plant material, but you also see some pointed canines, which indicates that part of the diet, at least, is um, flesh. The next system I wanted to talk about is the excretory system. The job of the excretory system is to maintain homeostasis of water and salts, and then also to rid the body of metabolic waste, such as urea or ammonia. Even the simplest animals have a system for this, and um, even single cells. We talked about paramecium having a contractile vacuole, and single cells having lysosomes. So this is an important process for all kinds of organisms, from a single-celled organism all the way up to us. So um, we have two sets of excretory organs. We have the accessory organs, and we have 
the um, main excretory organ. In most animals, it's kidneys. And then the accessory organs include the lungs, the skin, and the liver. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how it is that freshwater and saltwater fish can maintain homeostasis of water even in that in kind of environment. So let's talk about fish that live in a marine environment in salt water. The salinity of the seawater is much greater than the salinity of the body fluids. So the body fluids have to uh, shed water to the saltier environment. So the fish actually does take in some seawater. It has modified gills to excrete salt to get rid of the saltiness. And it produces very little urine to conserve fluids. By contrast, we have the freshwater fish, where the salinity of the water is much less than the body fluids. So it's going to gain water from the surrounding environment. So in order to combat that, it absorbs salt by the, from the gills. It urinates a large amount of dilute urine, and it does not drink. Okay, so these are two different ways to combat the issue of living in a watery environment. One having a high salinity, one having a low salinity. Let's talk a little bit about the respiratory system. The job of the respiratory system is to maintain homeostasis of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood and available to the cells. The respiratory system takes in oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. The respiratory and circulatory systems do work closely together to deliver that oxygen and remove the carbon dioxide waste. Here's an overview of the human respiratory system. Here we have um, the trachea coming down from the mouth. It branches into two main branches that are called bronchi, or singular bronchus, and then it branches like a tree into bronchioles and eventually to these little sacs called alveoli where the gas exchange takes place. In the alveolus, the capillaries, the blood, tiny little blood vessels, flow past. The blood coming into the alveolus is high in carbon dioxide because it's come from the body where the cells are respiring, are doing cellular respiration, and generating a lot of CO2. So we've got a high concentration of CO2 here, higher than what's, the, what's in the air coming in. And so the CO2 by diffusion will move across. As the blood passes by, at the same time, the concentration of oxygen here in the alveolus is higher than the concentration of oxygen in this blood that's passing by, and so oxygen moves by diffusion from the alveolus into the capillary. So gas exchange that's happening in the lungs is completely passive. It's just by diffusion. A similar kind of process happens in fish gills because that's how um, aquatic organisms respire. They um, have to extract oxygen from the water. So the way gills work is water, as they take in water in the mouth, they push the water back across the gills to come out. Um, and as the water passes by, it's passing through this um, highly vascularized, lots and lots of little capillaries. Water's going to pass across, and a similar process happens. Okay, so carbon dioxide, as it passes across, carbon dioxide moves um, from the blood vessels into the water. And um, on the other end, oxygen moves from the water into the blood vessels. So it's similar to what's happening in the alveoli, but except in this case, it's happening in the water. The next system I want to talk about is the circulatory system, and its job is to transport substances all throughout the body. It's transporting a bunch of different things, not just our oxygen and carbon dioxide. So it's, it's transporting, of course, oxygen from the lungs or gills to all the cells. It's transporting CO2 from the cells to the respiratory organs, either the lungs or the gills. It's uh, transferring hormones from where they're made in glands to their effector organs, wherever they're going to have an effect. It's transporting nutrients, such as glucose, to the body cells where it's needed, and other waste products from the cells to the excretory system, such as urea or ammonia. Now, there are two ways that animals have um, dealt with circulation. There's an open circulation and a closed circulation. Insects have an open circulatory system. They have um, a series of pumping chambers. Uh, we, you would call them a heart. And they go, the blood is passed from this pumping chamber out into these tubes, but then it's just open into these things called sinuses. Okay, it's just an opening. And then the, um, the blood passes around the body organs and back to the heart. It's just open on either end. 
and it flows around inside the body. Contrast that with a closed circulatory system, which is seen to be a little more efficient. In this case, you have blood vessels that carry the blood um, to each organ, and in each organ there are vessels that um, can take up substances, remove substances, um, but there's blood. it's a closed system, so these tubes return back to the heart. Rather than having the blood just flow around, um, it's actually going out in tubes and coming back in tubes. We call this a closed system. An example of an organism with a closed system is an earthworm. So when you take a look at vertebrate circulatory systems, um, I just wanted to do a little comparison. Fish have a case, of course, a closed system, but they have a single ventricle, which is a collecting chamber, and a single H I'm sorry, a single atrium, which is a collecting chamber, and a single ventricle, which is a pumping chamber, it goes out to the gills, out to the body, and back to the heart. So a single atrium, a single ventricle, two chambers. In an organism such as an amphibian, or most reptiles, not all, all but turtles, um, there is a three-chambered heart. In this case, we have a double loop. It goes from the um, ventricle pumping chamber out to the lungs or the gills, back to the heart with the oxygenated blood, back into the ventricle pumped out to the body, and then back to the other side of the heart in the right collecting chamber into the ventricle and back out to the um, lungs or the gills. And you can see that in this case, you have oxygenated blood mixing with deoxygenated blood. So it's not terribly efficient. It works, but it's not the best situation. Whereas in mammals and birds, you have a much more efficient system because you have four chambers. So you have the blood pumping from the ventricle to the lungs or gills, back to the heart with oxygen, and then out to the body, back to the heart, um, and then pumped again to the blood, the lungs or gills. So it's a double loop with four chambers, most efficient system. Okay, almost done. Now we just have the musculoskeletal system. In the musculoskeletal system, I'm lumping the muscular system with the skeletal system. It's a system of bones, muscles, ligaments, and tendons that provide structure to the body, to the organism, and support to the organism, and then also allow it to move. In vertebrates, bones are also the site of formation of blood cells. So it's in the bone marrow that all the blood is, is made. Um, and it's also a storage site for calcium. In invertebrates, there might not be a skeletal system, but only coordinated muscle movements, or they may have what's called an exoskeleton. So for instance, in sea anemone, they're held upright by what's called a hydrostatic skeleton. They have tubes of water within their body that help them stay upright, kind of like little water balloons inside. Um, and then we have in... Some invertebrates, such as arthropods, like this crab, there's an exoskeleton, so it's kind of like a shell on the outside, composed of chitin, which is a carbohydrate, and that gives it its structure. The trouble with the exoskeleton is, of course, they have to molt or shed. As they grow on the inside, the shell on the outside doesn't grow. They have to, sh they have to grow a whole new one and shed the old one. Um, vertebrates have an endoskeleton fish, amphibians, reptiles, all the way up to, to mammals and humans, we have the bo bones on the inside that give us structure. And the benefit of that, of course, is you don't have to molt or shed. Your bones grow with you. And this is just your, your typical joint. This is the elbow joint. I just wanted to remind you that um, we have muscles, flexors and extens extensors. We have bones. And then we have we have fibers, um, connective tissue fibers, called ligaments that hold bone to bone. And we have other um, connective tissue fibers called tendons that hold muscles to bones right here. So that gives you an idea of the names of those. All right, and to finalize the video, um, here's just a summary comparison of some organisms. A hydra is a cnidarian, very simple organism. We have an earthworm, an insect, which is an, a representative arthropod, we have a fish and we have a human, and you can compare the body systems of these. Digestion in a hydra is two-way. In an earthworm is one-way. Insect, one-way. Fish, one-way. Human, one-way. Respiration is by diffusion for many of these organisms. They just have a surface where the oxygen diffuses. But, of course, in fish and humans, there are gills and lungs. Circulation, again, is by diffusion in the simple organism. Same with excretory system. Um, and then you can look at the rest of this. We have a closed system in an earthworm, 
open system in an insect, uh, closed in fish and humans. Different names for some excretory organs here. And then the skeletal system for hydra and earthworms are hydrostatic. Insects have exoskeletons, and then the vertebrates have endoskeletons. Okay, that's it. 25 minutes. It's a little bit long. You can take it in pieces if you want. But that's it for this one.